Hi everyone, this is Vanessa Robertson. I'm also the author of the Arcane Adventurous series, starting with Canathrope, where a young woman named Vivian Harper learns to manipulate the world around her using the tarot as a focus. It's Victorian, it's steampunk, and it's got some magic and the arcane. So if you get a chance, check those out on Amazon. And now without further ado, Starhawks. Starhawks, Book One, Aegis. The jungle's heat was overwhelming. A dense green canopy crushed in around them, smothering the light, a lovely green mass concealing the human misery beneath. Alanwe Tresque, warrant officer of the Starhawks, touched the side of her helmet. Switch to thermal imaging. We can't see a thing in here. And everyone's set to kinetic charging and cool your duragel in your armor. I don't need anyone fainting from the heat. Shan Jin held up his fist, signaling everyone to stop. He motioned with his knife to a small, barely visible wire, just below knee level of flat gray metal. Alanwe crouched and followed the wire to an oval canister. Jin's voice came from his throat mic into their helmets. There's a thermal grenade here, rigged to blow if we hit the tripwire. This is why Shan led the pack. He always watched the land as he walked, moved like he was ballast shift by design. Efficient but quick, and more importantly, he had yet to trigger anything that killed everyone. Alanwe motioned her demolitions expert forward. Lindsay Turner followed Shan's footsteps to the tripwire. Clever bastards, it's a stun grenade. Rigged with firebomb, we hit it and it knocks us all for a loop, then fries us where we stand. With practiced ease, he untangled the wires and packed both bombs away. Shan's hawk helmet stared at the weapons tech. You're carrying those on your person? Remind me not to march too close. I had an uncle, and he was a slobbering, stumbling drunk. He was damn coordinated when compared to you. Oh, I never slip up when it comes to ordinance, Turner said. Still have all my fingers and everything. Shan's laughter was hollow. You just put that in your thigh pouch, brother. Believe me, your fingers won't be the first thing to go. Peter Cole, distinguished only by his medic pack and the fact that he only carried a single sidearm and a rifle slung over his shoulder, much less than the rest of those walking tanks shushed them. You hear that? Someone, several someones, cried in the forest, their sobs drifting like morning ghosts through the air. The dipping and bowing trees waved their limbs, ghostly figures lamenting their people. I think so. Jin grew serious. Steady men, a long way ordered as they continued their careful march forward as she expected. Anything less disciplined, anything, any less, wow, any less disciplined unit would have rushed headlong deeper into the forest, urged by the whimpers of the captives and the hope of recovering living souls rather than dead bodies. As it was, Jack Forrester, the youngest of her crew, strained to stay in formation, his forward gait leaning toward the cries. The sounds of human misery grew as they neared. Her legs shook with adrenaline, wanting to leap into action. They spotted the captives corralled in pens of webbing, webbed cargo netting. The pen was just a formality. The people huddled inside were frozen in panic. Citizens and civilians alike clung to one another in terror, sobbing and praying. A few warily watched their captors, but most just stared at the dirt. Four pirates casually patrolled the pen's perimeter, fingering long-bladed weapons and guns, a mix of slug throwers and laser pistols. Seven others sat around a fire, watching another man turn a spit. As one of them shifted, she could see the meaty limbs of some sort of local wildlife, roasted bronze from the fire. A Lanway circle is to assess the situation. The captors at a small camp, maybe 150 feet or so across if he didn't count their ship making a windbreak on one end. The ship would give cover to both the pirates and the hawks alike. The hostages were all exposed. They would have to be careful not to catch them in the crossfire. She wasn't worried about her men. They were disciplined, but the pirates were the embodiment of chaos, and chaos brought death. One of the hostages who looked out of all the hostages, who looked like they could be an asset. Her sharp eyes scanned over the people huddled in the cargo netting. They were all harvesters or miners. Those strong ones, they were just about used up. Then she spotted a woman, a mother and a baby, tucked against her breast. Haggard and tired, she shielded the child from her captors. She was defeated, but she stood. 
maybe not for herself, but for the life in her arms. The settlers had been bound by a promise of a term of settlement that would earn them citizenship. Alanwe was sure these pirates had not been part of the recruitment paperwork. The woman's ear had been turned and hung ragged and bloody, soaking her collar and attracting flies. For the moment, her child was scared into silence, his large, wet eyes like saucers, glancing around. Ears were such fragile things, she touched her own, scarred from old battle, and at the moment, the mother glanced up. Their eyes met across the camp. The pain in the woman's eyes held her gaze, pain, up close where it couldn't be ignored, where it had to be answered. Nothing masked the misery or the naked plea in the woman's eyes. It shook her. Alanwe pressed a finger to her lips, trying to signal with her eyes, we are here to help. They'd have to help soon. The pirates had to be taken out quickly and cleanly. Everything about their camp, from the uneven tilt of their ship to the haphazard storing of hostages, said they would either ransom or space them, reeked of desperation. Desperate men were not known for careful planning and rational thought. They panicked, and panic causes good people to die. Tactical squads, like the stock Starhawks, were precision units, but for the moment she regretted leaving several of her men back at the main settlement to restore communications to the rest of the settled universe. More men might allow this to go peacefully or turn it into a shit show. Damn pirates, they didn't have the sense of civilized men. The wind shifted, sending smoke from the cooking fire wafting their way. Alanwe's stomach rumbled at the scent of real meat, scrap to be sure, so it was uninspected, but it looked clean. Probably poached right off the land. It smelled so much meatier than the spirulinic pro protein-based rations from their ship. They may be pirates, but they know how to eat, Jin said in her helmet, echoing her thoughts. Alanwe circled back to her men. The mother and child still in her thoughts. They would need cover and fast. Cole made a face and mimicked gagging. Like many raised in the core worlds, Peter Cole couldn't digest animal meat. He would get the enzyme shots if he wanted, but maybe he just didn't care to. Alanwe held up her hands, indicating ten by her count. Her men nodded. Copy that. She motioned for them to follow her in a wide circle to the north. They followed, weapons in hand. Her men moved in pairs, one ducking behind the cover of trees and rocks, another moving up, rifles drawn, moving quickly on nearly silent feet. Jin moved in beautiful, even steps, his head and shoulders almost perfectly aligned, staring down the side of his rifle, ready to lay down cover fire if needed. Cole lumbered along like a tank of carboplast and med packs, armed with deadly weapons. Turner waited his turn. As soon as Cole took up cover position, Alanwe moved up, watching for the pirates to move, watching her men, scanning for signs of fatigue or stress, picking her cover. Turner moved with her off to the side. They flanked the pirates. They moved into position to protect the captives, brisk, calm, efficient. There was a reason her tactical task squad had been sent by the Council to protect the descendants of First Earth. Alanwe reviewed their objective. Get the threat, control the threat, protect the hostages, protect the mother and child, and get them home. These pirates were about as poorly armed as she had seen. They were here to steal whatever they could from the settlers of Kahawa before a true peacekeeper force could be established, then get back into the black before anyone could stop them. All but Jin were in position. He would be the last to move to get the hostages for out from under the cover of fighting. At her signal, Turner stepped out from behind his cover and fired a burst of three shots into a nearby tree. Two of the pirates hit the ground. One grabbed for a rifle propped up against a rock. Several froze and shrieked. Only one had the sense to take cover. Alanwe knew she had to confront them, give them a fair chance to surrender. It was part of the job. The AGG didn't execute unless necessary. The law needed to be upheld. She took a deep breath, tightened her hand on her gun, the leather pad of her gauntlet creaking. She popped out from cover. You are under arrest for piracy and poaching in the name of the Allied Galactic Guardianship and the High Council of... The pirate that had managed to grab the gun fired at her, forcing her to take cover. Charges from the blaster-type rifle lanced into a tree, releasing the stench of burning sap. Cole fired back, striking the rocks, forcing the pirate to take cover. Her warrior medic wasn't a bad shot. The pirate popped out a moment later. He wanted another shot, but Alanwe had already moved to new cover. Rabbits stayed put. People who wanted to live, they moved. Alanwe shouted, Last chance! Surrender! Another pirate fired in her direction. A sound like tearing paper roared and bullets chewed the ground and skipped along the dirt. Shit! 
That pirate had a slug thrower, a weapon both barbaric and brutal. She hated those things. Cole, Jin, secure the hostages. Turner, pirates, Alanwe yelled above the noise. A pirate leveled his gun at Alanwe. The slug thrower gave a crack and then a click. The outlaw screamed in frustration. Her gun had jammed. She racked it again and again, trying to clear the brass. Turner bolted forward and slammed her into the ground with a flying tackle and punched her in the jaw. He stood over her unconscious body and gave a triumphant bellow. Turner created his own brand of controlled chaos. Another pirate recovered enough of his wits to shoot at Turner. The slug thrower's heavy bullet pinged off Turner's carboplast armor, creating a deep skip mark. He ducked in reflex. Alanway's laser pistol lanced through the intervening distance, crisping tree leaves before cutting into the pirate that had shot at Turner. He crumpled into a heap. She searched for Jin and found him. He'd snuck around and was now slicing through the cargo net and corralling the hostages. He moved among them, motioning for them to go through the gap. The mother clasped her baby tighter and nervously glanced both ways. One of the pirates caught the movement. He turned and gave a short yelp before gurgling and falling with Jin's knife in his throat. Sharp as a razor, it went through the carboplast joints. Turner mowed down standing pirates as Carbine and Handle, several of their well-armed shots, zinged off his armor. Other pirates cowered behind cover. A pirate rolled to his feet, gun in hand, his laser cannon slammed into Alanway's thigh, knocking her leg out from under her. The shockwave was brutal, and she hit the ground hard. Carboplast absorbed laser fire, but it didn't minimize kinetic impact. It knocked the wind from her. Damn! Alanway rolled. The pirate fired again and missed. She fired back, stretching out on the ground. He howled in pain. Either he had no armor, or it was in horrible repair. Expired armor went too soft for real combat. Cole slid to her side and holstered his weapon, ready to give aid. Alanway waved him off. He pulled his laser pistol and fired two shots. One was absorbed by the pirate ship's hull, shielded. The other burned through a pirate's face, spraying gore as he crumpled. Cole cursed. He hated killing. No matter how often he was forced to do it, it always offended him. Jin was out of sight, Alanway noticed. Sneaky little man. He better be where he's supposed to be. If he was out of position, there was a very real possibility he was going to get himself shot. There was no question about the whereabouts of the rest of her men, though. Turner fired several shots and pirates crumpled to the ground, clutching mangled and burned limbs. One gave a hiss and fired wildly, missing everybody. Alanwe rushed to help Turner with the pirates. People panicked in a firefight, and when people panicked, people died. Usually the wrong people died. So the Starhawks did what they were trained to do, keep the bad guys' attention on them, trusting their armor to protect them from subpar weapons, while the settlers took the needed time to cover and move to safety. Off in the cover of trees, their ex-sniper turned pilot Harrison took cover in the shadows cast by the foliage and selected his targets as they moved off to threaten his squad mates or the hostages. There would be no advantage the pirates could press, no repositioning. They were pinned down but superior by superior firepower. The pirates picked the wrong settlement, and there would be no chance to choose again. Between the scent of cooked animal flesh and the faint ozone of laser weapons, the clearing took on a sickening reek that simultaneously stirred the appetite and repulsed the palate. Battles never took as long as you might think. A whole lot of noise, then a whole lot of cleanup. Turner and Alanway finished dual-handed sloppy shots at pirates, maintaining their attention while Cole and Jin flanked them. There was no answer but the bark and crack of sl slug throwers exploding the trees and zinging the zinging of laser pistols. Hostages shrieked and cried. Children screamed. Damn archaic slug throwers. The pirates were going to hit everything that moved now. Those slug throwers fired metal bullets and were good for collateral damage and cover fire. And anything where actual destruction was the goal. Good had landed in areas with a true atmosphere. And most importantly to the pirates, they were cheap. Those weapons were messy. One good strafe would kill every hostage they have, and the wounded mother and child included, and ruin their bargaining position. Kill her men and royally piss her off. Sweat trickled down her back, and she had nothing to do with the heat. More casualties were unacceptable. Alanway fired at targets as quickly as she could. There would be no surrender, she realized, only noise and chaos. A knife was pulled by a pirate who rushed Alanway, and he died before he took two steps. There was a gurgle of someone choking on blood, a few final zings and cracks, and then, in the sudden quiet, a sobbing hiccup of those long protected from the violence and suddenly thrust within it. When the smoke cleared, Alanway looked around the clearing. 
the black furrows cut into the earth were filled with the blood from the pirates and settlers alike and the land that had been so full of noise and chaos was now a silent graveyard the hawks walked among the pirates kicking weapons away from lifeless hands there would be no more trouble trouble from these predators of civilized men the hostages huddled together sobbing and gasping for breath they needed to be returned to their people returned to the only safety they knew they needed to get away from the scene of blood and death some of them stared at the death both pirates and their friends while others refused to look fearing they would see their loved ones along they scanned the survivors faces but didn't see the mother her heart pounded beneath her jaw in a way that had nothing to do with the recent battle the mother with the bloody face and the infant in her arms was not among them she unsnapped her helmet and tucked it beneath her arm the fresh air chilled her sweat-soaked forehead her men followed suit the threat was over, and the survivors needed to connect with the faces of their very human saviors rather than their cold, carboplast helmets. She motioned her intelligence officer closer. Jim, I hate to split us further, but it looks like I'm not going to have a choice. With no peacekeepers to speak of, they now needed to deal with the loss. In death, their faces were in human masks of both peace and horror, freed from their lives of hardship in this horrible, tragic way. Shen Jin began lining people up. I'll take them back. We're not a full peacekeeper force, Commander, Turner said softly, his deep voice reassuring and low. Our job is to do recon and deal with immediate threat. If we had the manpower, we could carry these poor bastards back in our arms, muttering sweet words of comfort. If you want them around for the cleanup, it's your call. She shook her head. This is an enemy I never know how to fight, Alonwe said quietly. Give me rebels, insurgents, assassins, something I know how to fight. These pirates, there's no logic to how they fight. No leaders, no plan, just fear and greed and spite. And we just keep finding more of them. You'll know what to do, sir. You always figure it out. He cuffed her shoulder affectionately. That's why you give the word. That and brass pin all those little badges on you and all. She gave him an indulgent smile. Turner would follow orders without complaint, but not without lip. Mr. Jin, guide them back to Beauville. Stay on calm, stay alert. She turned to address the hostages, suit and tear-stained faces. You all have been through a lot, and I'm sorry, but I have to ask more of you. It is time to get your wounded home. She saw some of them mouth the word home. Eyes brightened with sudden hope. Other eyes remained dull in horror. She cleared her throat. She was commissioned to kill pirates, not comfort those whose loved ones the pirates had killed. But she, too, had once been one of the lost and shattered on a battlefield. She couldn't turn her back on the settlers. We will remain with you until the uh, Allied Galactic Guardianship representatives arrive to protect you and care for you. She felt hollow inside, but continued. The Council is sending their forces to tend to your wounded, to deal with this threat, to bury your dead, to help you rebuild. This injustice will not go unanswered. Your people love you and will do everything in their power to support you. A forced march through hell itself, Cole said. Abandon all hope, ye who enter. Hoo-yah, Turner agreed. Jin lifted his rifle in salute. Charismatic and friendly, he began partnering people up to walk together. The hail carried their wounded, and they helped each other with the knowledge that, through the lives they were returning to, were far away from, were far from easy. Their futures wouldn't be spent as hostages. Along we stared at the pirate ship on the far end of the clearing. It was a dented, ugly mass of metal with chipped paint cobbled together from several different ships. How the hell do they even fly this thing? Ask Harrison, Turner said, readying his rifle. He went from sniper corps to engineer corps, so he knows all sorts of weird shit. Along we squared her shoulders, preparing to open the hull's door. Wait, sir, we can't go in there, Cole brought her up short. Why the hell not, Turner growled. Cole tilted the radiation monitor at his collar to check the reading again. Radiation's off the charts. Heat coming off that ship itself would burn straight through our armor before too long. Bet my rifle the radiation inside is stronger. We have about two hours before we start seriously harming our chances to have children. What's the source? Alonwe nudged one of the dead pirates with her boots. Scanner says it's similar to the element we use for terraforming, Cole said, and then tucked his scanner away. Weaponized, maybe? Alonwe glanced at the dead pirates. If it's anywhere near as radioactive as terraforming elements, we shouldn't leave it here. It'll contaminate the whole area. Question is, why didn't Psychor take it with them after surveying the planet? 
I think it's the ship themselves, Cole said. That or it would have burned up all the land around it. I'm sure Harrison can figure out a way to drag the ship out into space, and then I can demo it, Turner said. Alonwe set her hands on her hips. If we can't get into it, you sure can make sure there's nothing else in it. Turner, you still have their firebomb? Turner smiled. Oh, yes, sir. I have their bomb. So, that is part of the first chapter of Starhawks Aegis, where a ragtag group of a tactical task force is set to find out all sorts of horrible things are happening in the world that they love, set far into the future, where mankind has abandoned its first home and set off for a life in the stars. Starhawks Aegis is currently in uh, final copy editing, and we'll be ready to go to print soon. I hope you've enjoyed this look into Starhawks Aegis, and I hope to see many of you soon at our next in-person con, where you can pick up your copy and have it signed, um, or you can look for it soon on Amazon, both as an ebook and as a paperback. Thanks.